morning. Let's stand together and sing, This is the Day. standing, go and greet each other. Good morning, good morning. <laughs> Such a friendly group of people. So Chandler came down this morning and looked me right in the eye and he said, do not forget to tell everyone that we are live on Facebook today for the very first time in many, many years. So hello to you out there on Facebook. Um, want to be part of it. <laughs> Welcome to First Baptist Church. Um, if you are a visitor today, um, we're grateful that you're here, grateful that we can worship together. And if you're a first time visitor, or if you're a visitor who's never met our pastor, after service today, he's going to run around and be in the back, and he would love to meet each and every one of you and just say hey and, um, and just put a name to a face. And so if you take a moment before you go and say hi to him, that would be much appreciated. So when I was growing up, um, we were outside all the time, and I know many of you were outside also probably growing up. And I developed a love for the outer doors. And so sunrises and sunsets and the stars and the trees and the wind and all that stuff was just magnificent to me. And when I became a follower of Christ later in my young adulthood, my time in nature changed and I began to look at all of those same things and realize that those are really God's finger pointing to him. The created thing that I enjoyed so much was really pointing me to the creator. I just didn't know it at the time. And I lead in with that to say, last Wednesday night, after our members meeting, I don't know how many of you were out that night, but we were driving home, Jennifer and I, and there was the most amazing full moon sitting on the horizon. I mean, it was stunning. There were clouds. And it reminded me of a devotional that I had read one time. And it talked about how the moon has no light within itself, but it reflects the light of the sun. And in the same way, God's call in our life as followers of Christ 
because we don't really have any light in us worth reflecting, is to reflect his son's light in us to a world that needs it so desperately. I don't know if you've ever been on a cave tour. I'm gonna make this real brief because my two minutes is up. Um, if you've been in a cave, you go under the ground, you get in a dark, dark cave, and there are people around, the tour guide goes up front, they turn the lights off, they warn you, of course, and they say, put your hand in front of your face, and you can't, you can't see anything. That's darkness. But when the tour guide, quite a distance away, lights the candle, it lights up the entire cave. So God is telling us, the darker this world gets, the more significant your light may be, even though you don't feel it's that significant, a light in that kind of darkness is gonna point people to Savior. So next time you see a full moon, or you see a sunrise or a sunset, remember whose you are, and also who you are. You are a child of the creator of the universe, and God has a plan and a purpose for every single one of our lives. He has a personal knowledge of who we are and what we do. So with that being said, let me pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are grateful for how you um, surround us with so many things that point to you, Lord. Nature, um, the way the human body works. Um, there's just so much, Lord. And I pray that we will all look around and not miss what you have for us to continue to remind us who you are and can you continue to remind us to live that life you call us to, Lord. And I'm thankful, we are thankful, Lord, for being able to gather here today, today on a Sunday to worship together, to hear your word preached. And when we leave here today, Lord, to go out into the world and be your light in a world that needs that so desperately. We love you, Lord. We pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, if all the children would please go ahead and make their way to the, for, uh, to the front, we will have children's sermon. Can you say hello? Uh, thank you. All right, good morning. Again, um, our scripture reading today comes from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. He is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Amen. Good morning. Um, it's a great, great group of kids, and I'm so glad you guys are patient and pay attention and listen. I want to talk to you soon on this morning about something I brought. Have you ever seen so many keys? <laughs> yeah, it weighs about 10 pounds, it seems like. Now, I wonder which one of these keys might be the most important. Because there's a house key, and there's car keys, and there's keys to work, and then there's this little bitty key on here not really sure I even remember what it goes to. But if I ever need it, I got one to try. If I ever run into something I don't know how to open, I've got this little bitty one on here. So it'd be hard to say which one of them is the most important. Do you know that in the Bible there was a discussion of who was the most important? One day the disciples and Jesus were walking down the road and the disciples started fussing among themselves. Now, Y'all have never done that with your siblings, have you? Have you ever fussed with your sister? I bet you have. I bet you all have at one time or the other fussed with somebody. 
And they were fussing among themselves about who was the most important. So when they got to where they were going, Jesus said, who are you guys talking about? And they thought, "Uh uh-oh, we've been caught. Because they didn't really want to tell him what they were fussing about. But they did. And Jesus had something to say to those disciples. He said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. Well, that wasn't really what they wanted to hear. They wanted to hear that one or the other of them was the most important disciple there was. That's not what he said. He told them they had to give themselves up to be servants to others. And then he called a small child over. And he said, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. So he's telling them to be the the most important. You've got to forget about being the most important. You've got to give your life to taking care of other people. Now, if I ask you who the most important person in the world is, I think I would probably get some different answers, but I want to tell you the real answer. As Christians, we have to know that Jesus Christ was the most important person that was ever on earth. He came, he gave, he he surrendered and gave his life for us, just for us. So just like it'd be hard to pick out one of these keys as the most important, it's not that hard to pick out who the most important person ever was. And he calls us to lead a life just like he led, as servants to those around us. So that's the best way you can show Jesus how much you love him is to Live the life that he wanted us to live. Okay? So can we say a prayer this morning? Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we just praise you for for coming and sacrificing and, and showing us how much you loved us, Lord. I just hope that each and every one of us will remember each and every day that that we need to live the life that you showed the example of. We need to serve those around us and and put others in front of ourselves, Lord. Not always think about ourselves, but think about those around us, Lord. I ask you to go with us and be with us as we go through the rest of this day, Lord. Amen. We're going to sing a three-hymn medley, The Lily of the Valley, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, and The Solid Rock. Let us stand as we sing. Thank you.
you would bow your heads with me, we'll uh, pray for our offering this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, thank you again for how you bless our lives. Thank you for giving us the ability to give back, Lord. Help us to be wise in how we use your, the offering this morning, Lord, and help us to live lives of sacrifice, Lord. Help us to put others before ourselves. Um, we love you, Lord, and we pray all this in your son's name. Amen. city was Jerusalem, the time was long ago, the people called him Jesus, the cry was the love he showed, and I'm the one to blame. I caused all the pain. He gave himself the day he wore my crown. He brought me love that only he could give. I brought him cause to cry. And though he taught me how to live, I taught him how to die, and I'm the one to blame. I caused all the pain, he gave himself. The day he wore my crown, he could have called his holy father and said, take me away, please take me away. He should have said, I'm not guilty. And I'm not going to stay, I'm not going to pay. But he walked right through the gate, and then on up the hill. And as he fell beneath the weight, he cried, Father, not my will, and I'm the one to blame. I caused all the pain. He gave himself the day he wore my crown. I'm the one to blame. I caused all the pain. He gave himself the day
Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us today. So excited to uh, bring the word to you. We are going to continue on in Philippians. We're in chapter 2. Um, and we are going to read Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. We're going to focus our sermon today on 5 through 8. So if you would, please stand with me for the honor of reading God's word. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he, him- he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself and be- by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason... God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this beautiful passage about Christ, along with the one that Clint read earlier. God, thank you for who Jesus is. Lord Jesus, thank you for your willingness to come and live on this earth, to die on the cross for our sins. We love you and praise you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So this morning we're talking about the example of Christ. The example of Christ. Again, primarily looking at verses 5 through 8. And verse 5 starts off with this this statement, to adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Uh, And I'm sure many of you remember, but in the 1990s, there was a huge movement. And in fact, I saw a wristband the other day with it on it. I think maybe it was Chris Sienis was wearing it. Uh, But uh, WWJD, you remember this? WWJD? Okay, good. Uh, What would Jesus do? Not what would Joseph do? Don't, not, not the right way. All right, now, what would Jesus do? This was a huge movement. I, I was doing some research on it today, and actually, and I found out that uh, this phrase, what would Jesus do, uh, was really popularized in the late 1800s by a pastor in Kansas who wrote a book, kind of a, you know, encouraging Christians to ethical limi- living, and he, he, you know, he said, what would Jesus do? Uh, and then it repopularized in the 90s. There was a youth group somewhere in the United States that decided it would be a good idea to get wristbands that said WWJD as a reminder. And it is. It's a good reminder. And it's a good way to live. What would Jesus do? That's a good way of thinking, right? We need to live our lives the way that Christ would live his life. And that's kind of what this passage is talking about. How to look at the example of Christ and imitate his life. Look at the example of Christ and imitate his life. So we must see Christ's example for the type of humility that's required for unity in the church. Because if you remember, this passage that we're looking at today is building off of the thought that we talked about last week, which was the whole, the whole message was about the unity in the church, right? Paul gave these Christians a seven-step plan for how to uh, see unity in their church, right? A seven-step plan sounds like a book that a Christian author would write today and make a lot of money, but it's right here in the Bible. Seven-step plan. He said to think the same way, have the same love, be united in the Spirit, have the same purpose, not be selfish or conceited, humbly consider others as more important than yourself, and look at others' interests instead of your own. So we see that there's a seven-step plan for unity in the church, and if we do that well, then we'll be unified as a body of believers, and that's the hope. But there's more to that, because there's this question, then how are we going to uh, follow what we're supposed to follow? How are, we, how are we going to do what we're supposed to do? How are we supposed to live out that seven-step plan? Because if we look at it, right at, the, we talked about it last week, if we look at that plan, it looks really good, and it's something that most of us would be like, oh yeah, that sounds great. We'll think the same way, we'll love the same love, we'll, have, you know, be, we'll be united in spirit, this is all be good. Uh, but then the second someone disagrees with my way of thinking, I'm going to get really angry about it, and I'm going to split the church, right? That's what, that's what happens. Unfortunately, so many churches are just uh, have so many issues with disunity and discord and church splits over minor, minor things. Uh, and what we talked about last week was how we have to keep the uh, essentials essential and everything that's not essential to the gospel, that has to be in second and third and fourth place, right? It has to be behind the essentials. So how are we supposed to live out this this, uh, unity that we're called to? Well, 
we have an example. We have an example in the person of Jesus Christ. And, and we don't look at Jesus just as an example. Okay, that's an important distinction that I want to make because this passage, it's not just that Christ is an example for us to follow. He's much, much more than just an example. Okay, it's not like we see Jesus and we say, yeah, that Jesus was a really good guy. He said some cool things about loving each other and being nice to your neighbor and, you know, Jesus did some good stuff. He healed people maybe, I don't know. Like, that's not how we're supposed to view Jesus. Right, C.S. Lewis, you you guys know who C.S. Lewis is, wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, amongst other things. Uh, But in his book, Mere Christianity, where where he kind of explained what he believes about Christianity, the essentials of the faith, he said that you can't look at Jesus and say that he's just a good guy, like a really good guy. Because if you examine the claims that Jesus made, and if you look at the life that he lived, he's either a liar a maniacal liar who was just trying to get all the attention for himself, or he's a lunatic, as C.S. Lewis said it, like a poached egg, right? He's like completely insane. Or the third option, he is the Lord of all. Liar, lunatic, or Lord. So Jesus isn't just an example like a good guy worthy of paying attention to and listening to. He is an example, but he's so much more. And so today, as we kind of break down this passage, This is one of those passages that's literally, um, it's one of the most powerful passages in all of Scripture. Uh, It just describes who Christ is, the beauty of Jesus Christ. And it's really dangerous for me to preach because I could say something wrong really quickly. Uh, So I'm going to be very careful today as we work through this text because I don't want to mislead anybody about who Jesus is. I want you to see from Scripture exactly who Christ Jesus is and what makes him so beautiful and what makes him the perfect example for us to follow as a church as we pursue, pursue unity. So, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. There's three things as we look at the mindset of Christ. Okay, that word attitude, it kind of actually, it really goes back to uh, Philippians 2.2, 2, where it says to think the same way and have one purpose, be the same, have the same purpose. It's the same Greek word for think and purpose. So it's, it's really have the same mindset as Christ, have the same mind about you that Christ has. And the reality for the believer is, not only do we look at Jesus as an example, as some far off example that we may or may not be able to, to attain, but in Christ... His mindset is now ours. So if, you, if you're a believer of Jesus Christ, then you can have the mindset that is in Christ. Okay? And so that's, that's what we're talking about. And if we're looking at this mindset of Christ, there are three things that stand out. First is his humility. Second is his obedience. And finally, his sacrifice. His sacrifice. So I'm going to read again verses 6 through 8. And uh, that's what we're going to focus on today. So uh, read with me. It says, "Who exi- Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross." All right, so first things first, let's look at the humility that's displayed in Christ. The humility displayed in Christ. I I found a couple of quotes about humility that I thought were particularly helpful and interesting, and so I'm going to read these. Uh, The first one is from St. Augustine of Hippo, okay? So he's way back in the day, 300s, okay? Way, way long ago. But he said, for those who would learn God's ways, humility is the first thing, humility is the second Humility is the third. So if we want to be like Christ, if we want to be unified in the church, then humility is essential. And then Charles Spurgeon said it this way about humility. He said, humility is to make a right estimate of oneself. It is no humility for a man to think less of himself than he ought. Jesus did not think less of himself Jesus didn't have, we, we have kind of a, sometimes a twisted view of humility where we think that humility is equal to self-deprecation. And we put ourselves down 
And sometimes that comes out as a false, a feigned humility, right? No, I'm no good, I'm no good, but really we're just hoping for people to praise us, like keep piling on, like keep telling me how good I am. That feels really, really good. So uh, it's, it's not humility for us to put ourselves down. Humility is when we understand exactly who we are in light of who God is, in light of who Christ is. And Jesus had a, a wonderful mindset when it comes to humility. Jesus is the perfect example. So the first thing that we'll look at here in verse 6 is his divine humility. Jesus' divine humility. All right, so he existed in the form of God. Existing in the form of God. So Jesus Christ is pre-existent. That's what we see here, okay? This is one of the passages, one of many that shows us this truth, that Jesus Christ existed in eternity past with God the Father, and, and he didn't consider equality with God as something to be exploited. So he was equal with God the Father in eternity past. Always has been, always will be. Jesus is divine. He is God, okay? So uh, here's some other passages of Scripture just to, to emphasize this point. Of course, John 1, 1 through 3, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. Jesus, in His own words, says to the Pharisees, Truly, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. Right? Bringing in the Old Testament divine name, Yahweh, I am. That's Jesus' claim to divinity. Colossians 1, 16 through 17, Clint read this uh, in part earlier. It says, For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. And then finally, Hebrews 1 1 through 2 says, Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. So, some things that we have to address here, because this is really, really important. If you ever study church history, ever, and I, I encourage you to study church history for a couple reasons. One, history is fun. And two, it really helps understand how the faith that we know and have was shaped and formed over years as the Spirit of God led faithful believers to the place where we have uh, what we have today, right? Where we have this orthodox belief system. Um, but in the early church, there were a lot of questions about who Jesus was, Maybe even more specifically, what Jesus was. Was Jesus a man who, at his baptism, when the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove, became divine? Uh, was he, you know, it says in Colossians, the firstborn of all creation. Does that mean that Jesus was created, but he was God's first created being? You know, there's, there's questions that the early church had, and I'm really thankful we didn't live back then, so we didn't have to wrestle with them because they've been wrestled with for us. Uh, but no, Jesus was not a created being. Jesus was never created. He's always been God, right? He existed in the form of God in eternity past. That word form, it's a reference to his nature. He existed as God in eternity past. He did not attain divine status through right living. That was a belief system that, that, uh, that Jesus, after he did a really good job for a really long time, God said, that's my son. Yeah, he's the one, and, and gave him divinity. That's not what happened. Jesus was with God from before time, and in fact, through Jesus, all creation came into being. The next thing that we have to think about here is, that, is the equality with God. Jesus is equal with God the Father. They're co-equal, but Jesus did not view his divine status as something to be exploited or something to take advantage of for his own benefit, for his own good. Jesus considered others' well-being, our, specifically our well-being, before his own, right? He considered our interest, our eternal interest, before his own. And so 
he didn't consider his divine status, his equal authority in the glories of heaven as something to be get, kept and held on to. The word exploited, it means grasped, right? Like he, he wasn't reaching for it like something he didn't have. He was, it, was, it was that he didn't hold on to it like something he couldn't let go of. Uh, and I'm not saying that he let go of his divinity. I want to make very clear, there's never a moment where Jesus is not God. He's always God, even in his incarnation on earth. But he didn't cling to it in the sense that he didn't remain in heaven. Instead, he came to earth. So Romans 5 tells us that Jesus is the new and better Adam. Okay? Jesus is the new and better Adam. Jesus, he came into the earth, right? Like he he didn't cling to the divine status there in heaven. Instead, he emptied himself, came to earth. Uh, and, and now because of his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, Romans 5 tells us that he's the new and better Adam. And I think that there's something of a kind of a correlation here to that word uh, exploited or grasped as if something he was reaching for. And Adam and Eve and the story of the, of the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. So I'm going to ask you a question. This is trivia. If you want to answer, please do. That'd be awesome. So in the Garden of Eden, what did the serpent use to tempt Eve to take from the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What was the temptation? What did he say could happen? Do what? They would know good and evil. By knowing good and evil, who would they be like? They would be like God, right? So Adam and Eve, they saw the opportunity. They're not divine, right? They're human beings, just like you and me. And they saw the opportunity to attain, to take, to grasp the divine nature by taking that fruit and eating from it. And they did that. And let's not look too harshly on Adam and Eve because you and I would have done the same thing. Adam and Eve saw the opportunity to take divinity for themselves, to become God of their own life. And they tried to take that opportunity for them. And we try to do the same thing, right? When we know that what we're doing or saying or thinking is against the word of God and the will of God, and yet we do it anyways, in effect, we're telling God, I know better than you do. I'd rather be God than you. I'd rather be God over this area of my life. You be God over the rest. I'd rather be God on Monday through Saturday. You be God on Sunday. We do this all the time. But that's not how Christ viewed his actual pre-eternal, pre-existent divine status. Instead of clinging to it and using it for himself, it says in verse 7, we'll look at verse 7, it says that he emptied himself. And there's been a lot of discussion, by the way, of what did Jesus empty himself of? uh, of? Like what did he empty himself of his, you know, divine foreknowledge or his uh, omnipotence? Was he not all-powerful when he was on earth? You know, there's been a lot of speculation, but I think that the answer uh, to what he emptied himself of in specifics is not in this passage. But for the sake of what we're reading today, what Jesus emptied himself of was heaven. The idea here is that he made himself nothing. He went, the, the, it's, it's, a, it's to contrast the glories of heaven to sinful humanity where he came and lived, right? He left the glories of heaven. He came into this earth, uh, supernatural pregnancy, right? The virgin birth. But still, his, his, his skin, his flesh, his bones, his brain matter, his organs, they were formed in the womb of Mary, Right? He emptied himself of the glories of heaven. He came into his creation as one of his own creation, the same way that we do. And he did that all to take on the form of a servant. Right? Like even lower than just humanity, the word servant, slave, he took on the lowest status of humanity from the highest status in all of the universe, which is God to the lowest status, which is servant on earth. Jesus made himself nothing, and this is his earthly humility. So we've looked at his divine humility, and now his earthly humility. 
So there's a few things that I want to point out about his earthly humility. One, in in emptying himself, Jesus did not ever stop being truly God. Okay? This is essential for the faith. We believe in Jesus Christ, who is God and man. All right? He didn't... He, he didn't become a 50-50 split, okay? He wasn't like a demigod like you might see in Greek mythology or something like that, right? He was, he was truly, fully God and truly, fully man, okay? Never ceased being God. And then finally, he was a physical human being. In the early church, one of the first heretical things they had to fight against was claims about Jesus being uh, some sort of a, uh, kind of a, like a, hologram almost, really, is kind of how they thought of it. Like, Jesus wasn't a physical being, but he was kind of a ghost-looking feature. So he looked like a human. He kind of sounded like a human, but he really wasn't. And the reason they said that was because it was this, this Gnostic view that physical matter is inherently evil and spiritual is good. So Jesus had to have been spiritual only. Um, that was ridiculous. Jesus was physically a human being. If you read the Gospel of John, he gets tired. He gets hungry. He gets sad, right? Jesus experienced betrayal. Jesus was truly man in every sense. In fact, he, he even experienced death. And um, as we're continuing on here, he, he experienced humanity in the lowest form, right? As a servant, as a servant. Mark 10, 45 says, this is Jesus' own words, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He left heaven. He emptied himself of heaven, knowing that he was going to come and serve sinful man and die on the cross for our sins. He did that. He left heaven knowing what was going to take place. And Jesus was a human being. So, uh, as I said, he is not unfamiliar with our experiences uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16 says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Jesus humbly came to earth, he lived the life that we live, he lived a human life, and he did that for us. And I don't know if you've ever been taught that, uh, you know, if maybe by some religion you grew up in, that God is some far off, uninterested, uninvolved, you know, creator who just kind of sits back and lets things happen, Uh, but that is not the God of the Bible. The God of Scripture loves his creation, is involved with his creation, and lived on earth with his creation and died on the cross for our sins. He's not unfamiliar with our weakness. Jesus experienced hurt. He experienced betrayal. He experienced pain. Jesus experienced the same sufferings that we experience. He experienced death, which is an experience we'll all have. Jesus experienced these things so that he could sympathize with our weakness in a way that's unfamiliar to any other religion or lowercase g God that's ever been created or talked about. Jesus is so far greater than anything throughout history ever. And this is who he is. Now the last thing is his humble obedience. Jesus was obedient So we have that list of seven, like I said, uh, seven steps to church unity, think the same way, have the same love, so on and so forth. But in order for us to actually see the fruit of those things in the church, in our relationships with one another, we have to obey what it says, right? Like we can't just agree with the list, like that's good, and then not seek unity through these things. Jesus is the perfect example of obedience, So, looking at his obedience, did you know that Jesus learned obedience? Did you know that? Jesus learned obedience? That sounds weird to say, but it's true. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 says, Although he was the son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Jesus learned obedience, not that he didn't know obedience, not that he wasn't obedient. In fact, he was obedient in coming to earth in the first place, but he experienced obedience to the Father's will 
in a new way when he suffered and died for the sins of the world. Jesus had this unlimited obedience. There was nothing too far for him to obey. God put a pretty heavy burden on him, right? God the Father's plan was pretty hard. Jesus had to live among sinful people, and he had to be beaten to the point beyond recognition, and then he had to hang on the cross for our sins. Jesus had to experience all of those things, and he knew that, and he was fully obedient all the way through. As I was thinking about this this week, I was just struck by the thought, the realization that his obedience was not only to the will of the Father, but again, he kept the law of God perfectly, the heart of God perfectly throughout all of those things, the torture that he experienced, hanging on the cross, people spitting on him, people hitting him in the face, that there was not a single moment where Jesus had an evil thought towards one of those people who were hitting him, who were spitting on him, who were shoving the crown of thorns on his head. Jesus never had one vindictive evil thought towards them. He had compassion for them. He was dying for them. He was obedient to the Father in every respect. And finally, he's, he was sacrificially obedient. He didn't just die. He died the most painful death known to the world at that time. The Philippians, as Paul wrote this to the church in Philippi, they were Roman citizens. They knew how vile crucifixion was. It was so vile, in fact, that Roman citizens, when they received capital punishment, received mercy, and were just beheaded instead of experiencing crucifixion. For the Jewish Christians of the day, they would have been offended to think of their Savior on a cross because of how horrendous that is. But Jesus sacrificially gave himself, like I said, he was beaten beyond recognition. And remember, Jesus is a human being, by the way, a human being. He felt everything that happened. He felt the hits, the scourging. He felt the nails be driven into his wrists and into his feet. He felt his shoulders dislocate as he hung on the cross. He felt all of those things. He felt that feeling of suffocation because he couldn't breathe, because his, his arms were above his, his chest. He couldn't breathe. And the only way to get, get just so you know, the only way to get a breath on the cross is to push up. Did you know that when you push up, when you're on a cross, it hurts your feet pretty bad? Jesus felt all of those things. And on top of that, he felt the wrath of God, the punishment for our sin on him in its fullest extreme, in its fullest measure. He felt that at the same exact time. Jesus endured so much pain. He did this sacrificially so that you and I could be made right with God. He was making up for the sin of Adam and Eve and the sins that you and I commit. He was the perfect atoning sacrifice for our sin. So, why is Jesus, why, like, why did Paul go from, hey, be unified in the church, to, hey, look at Jesus? Like, why, like, be unified, and then also check Jesus out. Well, it's because he is everything I just described, the Son of God, the Son of Man. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for our sins. He did all of those things, because of who he is, he is our example. Because of who Jesus is, he is worthy of imitating. His life is worth imitating. And there's a few passages of Scripture to, to remind us to be imitators of Christ. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. 1 John 2, 6 the one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. In other words, do what Jesus did. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. By the way, that's, a, that's one heck of a place to be in your spiritual walk when you can look at others and say, hey, follow my example because I'm following his. And that's the goal, right? That we could all do that. And as we do that, we'll see the unity in the church in a fuller measure. So how will we ever experience the unity that God desires for his people in the church? How will we ever experience the unity that God desires for us in his church? The answer is very simple. We look at Jesus and we live the way that he lives. We can be humble like Jesus is because he lives in us. 
We can be obedient by imitating his obedience. And we can serve sacrificially because he served us with the greatest sacrifice that has ever, ever been known. And this passage isn't just a reminder to the Christians in the church who, who are, you know, pursuing and aiming for unity. It's a reminder to everybody here, including those who don't have a relationship with Christ. You know, the first step for a person to go from not saved, not, with, not in Christ, to saved, the first and most essential step is that we have to humble ourselves. We have to humble ourselves. We have to say, I'm not God. I'm not good enough to save myself. I can't make this on my own. And then we have to look to Jesus, look at the cross, and fall on our knees and repent from our sins and pray and ask God to forgive us. And 1 John tells us that he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So if you don't have a relationship with Christ, would you humble yourself today and would you accept him as Savior? And if you have accepted Christ as Savior, would you live as if he is the Lord of your life and imitate his humility? And imitate the way that his humility led to his obedience. And sacrificially serve. Consider others as more important than yourselves. You won't always get your way. Jesus didn't have his way on the cross. Well, he did because we were saved. But you won't always have your way. But if, we, if you have the same humble heart that Christ Jesus has and gives to you, then unity is attainable. Uni unity is within reach. I'm going to pray for us. We have a final song. And uh, I think it's going to be a cappella, correct? So you've got to sing with John Marks. I told him I would remind you. But uh, would you stand with us and sing this final song? And let me pray as we close out today. Dear God, thank you for who you are. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice, for your humility that, that brought you here. God, we are so undeserving. Thank you for your love for us. God, for people here today who don't have a relationship with you, I pray that you would show them through your word how beautiful Jesus is, his sacrifice, how, how, much th how thankful we should be for his sacrifice. God, I pray that you would be glorified in the way that people come to you today. We love you and praise you, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you sing with me, Just As I Am? Just as I am.